Hello everyone, welcome to uh, Greenway Chambers uh, ongoing CPD series. We're sorry for the late start but uh, Murphy's Law being the legal principle by which everything is determined of course things weren't quite going right for us at 5.30. But thank you very much for joining us. We've got a fascinating uh, presentation this evening on a topic which we think will be of great interest. Uh, Declan Byrne and Lucas Shipway are going to address class actions in construction law. Obviously class actions are something which have uh, become prevalent in recent times, not only in construction but in a number of other areas. And uh, those of us, or those of you I should say, who have had the opportunity to listen to the Greenway podcast that was in your feeds as of Monday, uh, will have heard something of a preview of what we're going to have. Now Declan Burns, our first speaker, he's going to deal with the nuts and bolts of class actions, uh, the rudiments of what are involved, the number of people involved, the sort of matters that need to be identified as essential features before one can proceed with a class action. And then Lucas Shipway is going to address uh, some of the cases, some of the more recent issues, including the recent High Court decision with respect to competing class actions uh, with regards to a particular set of circumstances or possible action. So if we can start with Declan. Uh, Declan's been a barrister since 2016, coming up to five years, a foundation member of Greenway Chambers, a specialist in construction law and someone who's going to tell us all about the rudiments, nuts and bolts of class actions. Thanks, Declan. Thanks, Frank. So I want to start with <coughs> a statement that class actions aren't that new to Australia. The federal court provisions commenced uh, about 30 years ago in 1992. Uh, Victoria introduced their scheme in 2000 and New South Wales on, uh, in 2011. Uh, Queensland followed later in 2017. So we're really coming up to the 10 year anniversary, or we came up to it about two weeks ago, of the regime in, in New South Wales. And so today we're gonna to focus on the New South Wales and Commonwealth schemes, which for our purposes are materially the same. I'm just gonna catch up on the slides. So I should start by saying, I'm, I'm gonna write a background, we're gonna go through some basic features, do the pros and cons, and then we're going to turn it over to Lucas to deal with some of the controversial and thorny recent issues. Um, as I said, there's been a uh, federal regime in place for almost 30 years, and we're on 10 years for New South Wales. So notwithstanding that the regimes have been in place for that long, we, and by we I mean construction lawyers, uh, have not typically thought of uh, construction claims through the lens of class actions. However, in the last few years, it seems like this may be starting to change because we have at least uh, four ongoing class actions that touch on the construction sector. And so with that in mind, uh, the discussion today is not intended to be a comprehensive uh, analysis of all the nuance of cases in this area. There's lots of uh, federal case law in particular. Instead, what we hope to do is provide an introduction and an overview of the, the key issues and, the, and, and how, you, how you use these representative proceedings as they're formally known. Okay. So let's start with the basics. Where's the legislation? So the federal le legislation is set out in part 4A of the Federal Court Act. Helpfully, every provision starts with 33 in a series of confusing letters. And there's also the practice notes there as well. Um, New South Wales, we have uh, part 10 of the Civil Procedure Act, and it uh, pretty much follows the federal, uh, federal legislation closely. Okay. Um, why now? Why are we doing this discussion now? Um, and that's because there's a bunch of class actions around. The first one from 2018, that's on at the moment, concerns the Sydney Light Rail Project. So these proceedings are brought on behalf of the uh, landowners and uh, business owners that uh, claim to be affected by the Sydney Light Rail Project. Uh, they concern allegations of nuisance in the form of... Uh, Damage, obstruction of roadways uh, and footpaths, excessive noise, vibration, dirt, dust, and light spillage. And uh, transport, uh, as the main defendant, has cross-claimed against the builder, Asiona. So that, that was commenced in 2018, still ongoing. Um, what is it now? Three years later. The next class action uh, uh, to deal with is the, uh, it's named Williamson and Sydney Olympic Park. Authority, better known as the, the Opal class action, and this one's been in the, the media a fair bit over the last couple of years. So these are proceedings that are brought on behalf of the lot owners in uh, Opal Tower, 
um, against the landowner. And they can sue on allegations uh, of uh, loss and damage suffered as a result of defective building work. Um, and the pleadings, which are available on the Supreme Court website, uh, claim the following loss of damage, which is a bit different from the normal uh, building defects claim. So you have, uh, first of all, there's the rectification cost they're seeking, um, to the extent that such costs are borne by the lot owners and not the owners' corporation. They also seek uh, the diminution in value of the apartments, the out-of-pocket expenses uh, for the period when they were unable to occupy the apartment, loss of rental income under the current and future leases, the strata fees uh, payable uh, to fund increased insurance premiums, and, and finally, uh, damages for, quote, inconvenience, stress, and vexation. So this one is quite complex and seems to involve half of the construction lawyers in New South Wales because I think at last count there's something like six cross claims. So the landowners cross claimed against the developer and the builder. Uh, the builders cross claimed against the structural engineer. The structural engineers cross claimed against the builder and the builder's precast wall supplier, and so on and so on. Okay, turning to the federal court, the two uh, class actions at the moment that concern the construction sector are. Uh, uh, deal with combustible cladding. So the first one is we have owners of Strata Plan 87231 and 38 Composites. And these proceedings are brought on behalf of the owners of buildings that have had uh, uh, aluminium composite panel cladding with polyethylene cores, or commonly known as the Alucabond PE and Alucabond Plus products. And so the claim concerns allegations for breach of the Trade Practices Act and all the Australian Consumer Law. And the, the, other, uh, the other case we've got up there, which is the Fairview Architectural one, um, is very similarly drafted uh, to the 3A Composites one. It's just concerning a different product. Um, one thing that's not on the slide, um, I was reminded by a colleague this morning that there was a further class action in the construction sector a few years back. For those of you that recall the Brisbane um, Airport Link uh, construction, there was a, uh, it was commenced in 2012, settled in 2016 with a $121 million settlement, as, as the lawyers for the, uh, the plaintiffs uh, advertise on their website. And this was all about uh, traffic forecasts and whether traffic forecasts of toll roads were accurate and whether the product disclosure statements that, uh, that people read uh, before they invested was accurate. So while it concerned infrastructure, that claim was more about uh, the investment side of things, so didn't get into the real nuts and bolts of construction like some of the more recent ones do. Okay, with that background in mind, let's turn to the requirements and, and what is a class action. So the ALRC did a report in 1988 and they described uh, class actions as what we got up, what we have on the slide, an effective grouping procedure as a way of reducing costs and enforcing legal remedies in the case of multiple wrongdoers. So there's, there's much more detail, but that's the, that's the basic thing. It's, a, it's an efficient way of dealing with multiple claims at once. In terms of the basics, there are three key features that you need in order to bring proceedings as uh, representative proceedings or class actions. So uh, the first one, you need to have seven uh, friends, you need to have seven people who have claims against the same person. And you only need the seven at the start. If for whatever reason during the proceedings uh, you fall below seven, the court has a discretion whether to allow you to continue the proceedings as a class action or whether you need to break it up and uh, continue each of the claims separately. The second thing that you need is the claims need to um, be in respect of or arise out of the same, similar or related circumstances. Pretty broad requirements, just some element of similarity is required. Uh, finally, you need to have a common question of law or fact across all those issues. So that's the three basic requirements. Okay, the next question is how do you become a group member? So the first thing to note is that there are two types of groups. You can have open groups, closed groups. Open class essentially includes all group members who suffer particular loss and damage by the conduct of the defendant. Whereas a closed class is, is, uh, is composed of a more limited group of people, usually when they're individually specified. Um, the general rule is if you're seeking to bring uh, representative proceedings and you're the representatives, you don't need consent of any of the other group members. The one exception for that, or I should say the main exception for that, is if you're intending, um, uh, if you're intending for a government entity, state, commonwealth, territory, uh, or a representative of one of those. 
if you're intending for them to be a group member, um, then, you, uh, then you need the consent to do so. However, although you don't have a chance uh, to object about whether or not you're initially included, the legislation requires that you be given an opportunity to opt out before the hearing. Uh, so that's important. Um, just to give you an example of some of the recent classes, uh, there was the BMW and Brewster case that just went to the High Court on the common fund question, which I think Luke's going to talk about. So the BMW case was one of um, seven cases concerning, I think it was the Takata airbags. And in the submissions to the High Court, the appellant BMW said that the potential members in the BMW proceeding, so one of the seven sets of proceedings, had potentially 200,000 group members. And that all seven together, uh, there was something like 2 million, uh, 2 million group members. So we're talking about pretty sizable claims um, in, in this new world order. Um, Another feature that's important is that any judgment in representative proceedings must describe or otherwise identify the group members who will be affected by it. And the reason for that is, is pretty simple. It, it binds all those people uh, once the judgment is given. So that's very important to keep in mind. Okay, now to practical matters, the pleading. So the first thing to do is your, your representative plaintiff, your named plaintiff, you just plead your normal case. That's the starting point then there's a couple of extra things that you need to add. So you need to firstly describe or otherwise identify your group members to whom the proceeding relates. So that's to make sure that there are at least seven. Then you need to specify the nature of the claims made on behalf of the group members and the relief claims. And then you need to specify the common questions. And I mean, you'd see that these line up pretty neatly with those three basic requirements that you need in order for there to be a class action. So those are the things you need to plead. Um, and as I said earlier, the Supreme Court publishes um, all of the class action uh, pleadings on its website. And so you can have a look there to see how various people have pleaded them over the years. Okay, um, one of the questions that everyone wants to talk about, what's the cost um, situation for class actions? So the nuts and bolts, the basic requirements, are that the court cannot award costs against the person on whose behalf the proceedings have been commenced other than the representative party. So that means if you're just one of those people that's in the class, not actively participating in the proceedings, there's no risk of you getting a cost order, even if the, uh, the proceedings are unsuccessful. If, if you are the representative party though, if you have taken the risk of, of a cost order against you and you've been successful enough that the court's made an award of damages, you can also apply uh, for reimbursement of your costs. And there's ways in which to do that set out in the legislation. Um, so that's the basic picture with costs. I'm gonna leave some of the more complicated questions for Lucas to do with. Fun and games. Next thing, settlement. Here's something that's a bit different to normal proceedings. You need court approval to settle or discontinue your proceedings. So if the court gives such an approval, they've also got a discretion about what other orders to make. Um, you know, orders that, that, that adjust um, with respect to the distribution of any money, including interest, and any payments made um, uh, by way of settlement or out of court. The basic criteria that the courts use to determine whether or not to approve a settlement uh, is whether it, the settlement, the proposed settlement, is fair and reasonable. And it's been said that it's not a matter of simply uh, a checklist to be ticked off, it's, it's, it's more discretionary than that. Um, and in uh, the 2017 case of, and I'm going to mispronounce this, so apologies, Blair Gowrie Trading and Orco, which was a decision of His Honour Justice Beach, he made a number of comments um, on settlements, which uh, I'd like to walk through. Uh, the first one is that there is no single way in which a settlement should be framed. Reasonableness is a range. So the question is whether the proposed settlement uh, and scheme fall within that range. So what does that mean in practice? Um, a settlement won't be, uh, the court won't refuse to approve a settlement because it doesn't represent the class's best outcome. It's not about that, it's about whether or not the settlement is in that reasonable range of possible outcomes. Second, uh, His Honour said, the court's role is not to second guess the strategic decisions made by the applicant's legal representatives but rather, once again, to satisfy itself that those decisions were within the reasonable range. Third, picking up on the checklist point, His Honour said there's no definitive set of factors that the court may or may not take into account in approving a settlement. 
However, he said some factors that might be taken into account by the court include the complexity and duration of the proceedings, the stage of the proceedings uh, when the offer is made, the settlement proposal is made, the risks of establishing liability, establishing damages and maintaining the class action, the ability of the respondent to withstand a greater judgment than the prospective settlement sum, uh, relatedly the range of reasonableness of uh, the settlements in light of the best recovery, and again the range of reasonableness in light of the usual risk of litigation, and finally the reaction of the class to the settlement. Um, the final point that his honour thought was important in, uh, was relevant in, in a court granting leave, sorry, granting approval of the settlement, um, is that this, the proposed settlement uh, be fair to the respective group members. So it must be ensured that the interests of the representative parties, the signed up clients of the solicitors, and any litigation funder um, are not being preferred over the interests of the group members at large, abs at least absent a compelling reason to do so. And so he thought that it was important as part of that um, that the group members be notified in a timely fashion of the proposed settlement. Um, and uh, once appropriate uh, notice has been given in absence uh, any objections or other response, um, that would be a relevant factor. So the obligation to notify group members obviously means that you need to identify who they are. And this can often cause some consternation, but um, as we said before, this is important because obviously once the judgment's issued, it's going to bind all members, all group members. So that's if we're talking about the settlement of the entire class. There's also occasions where your representative party, so the named plaintiff, may want to settle with the defendants but not settle on behalf of the rest of the class. Uh, because of their particular situation, you need the leave of the court to do that. And there's another, there's another catch. You've got to also seek leave to withdraw as the representative party. And the court's not going to give you that leave um, unless and until um, a substitution motion uh, for someone else to substitute as the representative party has been heard and determined. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, just before we get to limitation periods, after the court, after there's been settlement of the common issues or there's been determination of the common issues, um, the court has a power, a general power, uh, as to the procedure to be followed to deal with the remaining issue, the issues that may not be common, you know, for instance, the damages, the different damages that may be awarded for each of the uh, group members. So they, they've got a really general discretion of how you do that, whether they uh, set up different sets of different sets of hearings in the same proceedings, or direct particular uh, people to commence new proceedings. The next thing I wanted to talk about was limitation periods. Um, on the commencement of any representative proceedings, the running of the limitation period that applies uh, is suspended for group members. And that suspension continues to operate um, unless and until you either opt out or until the, uh, the proceedings are determined, including any appeals. So that's something to take in mind as well, keep in mind as well. Okay, the last thing I want to to go through is some useful comments from His Honour Justice Garling in Giles and Commonwealth, where he was weighing the pros and cons of representative proceedings. On the pro side, he thought that they were, they could be a cost effective mechanism. He thought they provided access to justice that might not be available, because individual plaintiffs may not be able to uh, have the resources to prosecute their claims. He thought from the court's perspective, uh, that they're an effective means uh, uh, in terms of allocating uh, the court's resources uh, to determine common questions. He also thought that it avoided the possibility of inconsistent judgments, uh, which could result in, in injustice, he thought, if, if, each of the separate proceeding, if each of the proceedings was to continue separately. Um, he also thought from the defendant's side that there were some upsides, um, and that is that the defendants can limit their liability in a timely and cost-effective way. Um, uh, again, he said, promote efficiency in the administration of justice. And finally, he thought um, class actions overcame the, or at least reduced, the inequality in bargaining power and any significant discrepancy uh, between the resources of the parties. So those can be minimised. So they're the pros. And then, of course, we have the downsides. He thought, and I think we've flagged these issues already, the biggest problem is... Uh, is identifying members of the group. He said the number and the identity of the group members and the amount of damages of their claims may not be known or else may be difficult to ascertain. 
and he thought that was going to be a difficulty for defendants in settling proceedings or else rationally estimating their value at an early stage. Um, apart from that, he, he thought there could potentially downside to be a member of the, uh, member of the group in that uh, you lose your direct control uh, over the manner and conduct of the proceedings. You leave that in the hands of your representative. Uh, he also thought, in, at least in the case of personal injury, and it's probably applicable to other types of claims, um, that uh, representative action is never going to be able to determine conclusively the quantum of damages to, that, each, um, that each plaintiff is entitled to, each group member is entitled to. So there you go. There's some pros and cons uh, from his honour. So apart from that, I'm going to hand it over to Lucas to deal with some thorny questions. Thank you very much, Declan. Uh, and as Declan says, uh, I'm going to uh, take what he said as a launching pad, as it were, to speak about some of the issues that I think um, are thrown up uh, by the recent changes or the recent developments in this area um, and some of the recent cases. Uh, a point that I think won't be lost on many of you is that... Uh, a key factor in the recent emergence or recent strengthening in the, in the frequency of, of class actions has been the role of litigation funders. And it's beyond the scope of this talk to talk in great detail about, about how they operate and, and the way in which they've come to be more involved. But I think it is worth spending a few moments um, talking about the, the role of the funders and some of the factors that affect or are of interest to the involvement of funders. I say that because I think those are factors that are going to influence where this goes in the future. And what we want to end on today, I hope, is some, some suggestions about where we are headed. So uh, it's necessary to descend into a little bit of uh, detail uh, on this point, I think, to make the point I'm wishing to, to, to make. And so bear with me as we, we, we go into some of the uh, technology or the uh, terminal, terminology that's um, used in this area. Um, the first um, point or topic I want to address in this regard is, is the common fund order. And um, for those of you who wanted to delve into this a little more, um, His Honour Justice Edelman in the BMW and Brewster decision uh, gives a very useful um, summary of, of how um, some of these factors operate. But and what I'm saying, what I'm about to say is taken in large part from what his honour says in that judgment. But um, just to explain what a CFO is, a, a CFO, a common fund order, uh, is typically made at an early stage in representative proceedings or class actions, and it provides for the quantum of a litigation funder's remuneration to be fixed as a proportion of any monies ultimately recovered in the proceedings so that all the group members bear a proportionate share of that liability and that liability uh, is discharged as a first priority from any mon money so recovered. In other words, a CFO reduces the amount payable to every member of the class if the action succeeds by way of a judgment or a settlement, even if members, um, even for members who have not agreed to the funder being involved or to the terms on which the funder is involved. Such orders um, are justified, uh, it's been suggested, because they require those who obtain the benefit of a litigation funding service, including the benefit of risk and cost incurred by the funder, to bear a proportionate share of the, of the, of the remuneration for that service. Uh, and they also, um, as his honour pointed out, uh, ensure that remuneration for the service is reasonable because the court ha has an opportunity to consider the CFO that's put forward. Um, the, the, um, the, the injustice which um, is sought to be avoided um, uh, where, where some group members but not others have entered into an agreement with a litigation funder uh, arises in two, two ways. Uh, firstly, um, a litigation funder might only be able to recover a small portion of its costs because it was limited to recovery of remuneration from those persons with whom it had entered into the agreement. Secondly, the, the group members who had entered an agreement with the funder were forced to bear all of the costs 
while other members who had not uh, could take the benefit of the proceeds of the litigation free from its costs. And, and, and those members are sometimes called free riders, and that's seen as a, a, um, a, as a, a downside from the point of view, at least, of the litigation funders. And as I'm sure you'll appreciate, the, the view is sometimes put forward that um, the, the presence of litigation funders in this space is in the interest of justice because, as I think Declan indicated, um, the courts have said that uh, um, sometimes uh, cases that would not otherwise get up are um, uh, taken forward because of the availability of funding. Um, now, the um, question of whether common fund orders were appropriate um, was considered by the High Court in in BMW and Brewster, and the court held that, in fact, uh, although they'd been used on numerous occasions, on a proper understanding of the rules, uh, the court, in fact, um, that is the Federal Court and the New South Wales Supreme Court, did not have the power to <coughs> make CFOs, um, at least at, at the start of um, proceedings. And the, the, the basis for that finding was that the rule that it had been relied upon provides that, um, in, in effect, gives the court the power to make orders that the court thinks are appropriate or necessary to ensure that justice is done in the proceeding. Um, and the court took the view that um, that did not permit the court to take into account in the manner that it had been in making these sorts of orders the interests of, of, of a party external to the proceeding, namely the, namely the funder. Uh, now, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a unanimous decision. Um, Justices Gagler and Edelman dissented, um, and His Honour Justice Edelman said this at paragraph 231, at times during these appeals there was a heavy focus in submissions upon arguments of policy. For instance, on the one hand it was submitted that in open and class actions, and I'll come back to what that means, a common fund order avoided inefficient and costly book building, which would ultimately enrich only the lawyers, on the other hand, it was submitted that it would be more sensible and logical for potential group members to be identified individually at an early stage and to be personally informed at that stage. These arguments at heart concern the extent to which and manner in which non-parties should intervene in another's litigation. The answers depend for their practical application on large questions which vary with changing attitudes to litigation. There may be doubt, his honour said, whether courts are the best forum for resolution of these questions of policy. And I think that's an important observation by His Honour and it runs through, uh, in my, my view, as a theme in this area because at the moment I think it's fair to say that the way the courts are working through uh, this area reveals that there is a, a tension between um, a number of different uh, considerations which weigh in different directions and, and the courts are um, feeling their way, I think it's fair to say, and uh, as I've indicated, there's been some, some um, backwards and forwards. Uh, there was a view that was taken and that was shown to be wrong in BMW and Brewster, for example. Uh, and so um, it's crying out for um, the intervention uh, of um, Parliament to uh, clear up some of those uncertainties. And I'll come back to um, what might be happening in that respect. Um, as uh, definitely indicated, um, there's been earlier uh, law reform reports, including back, uh, back in 1988. Similarly, 2018, there was a report. In that uh, report, the ALRC recommended that courts be given express powers to make CFOs. So that's the sort of regulatory intervention that I'm referring to. Um, an alternative to a common fund order, and one that has, uh, has been endorsed, it's perhaps a sort of light version of a common fund order, is, is something called a fund equalisation order. Um, they've been around for a little while. They were devised by the Court of Chancery in, in response to the situation where lawyers had entered cost agreements with, with only some group members. Uh, and what the court uh, did is to adjust the rights of all the parties to ensure that the costs incurred by the lawyers would be borne pro rata by all the group members who benefited from the litigation. The orders required payment into a fund for the benefit of the group um, of the costs received by the representative party, and the representative party was then entitled to deduct 
legal expenses from that fund, thus ensuring that the costs were borne pro rata. Uh, and so it differs from a common fund uh, um, order in that it, um, it doesn't set things in stone uh, from the beginning of the proceeding, but rather deals with the matter at the end. When I say set it in stone, common fund orders were always subject to review by the court, but they gave funders in particular some visibility of where things were headed um, at an early stage. Um, and so a funding equalisation order at least permits the uh, funder to, uh, in whole or in part, depending on, on, on the extent of recovery, recover its costs uh, and um, the recover the commission payable for, for group members who entered into the funding agreement. Where, that provide, where, where such a commission is provided for. Um, I wanted to move next to an example of how uh, these factors are playing out uh, in practice. Uh, Declan referred to the uh, 3A uh, composites class action, the class action in respect of Alunco bond composite cladding. Uh, the plaintiff's solicitors in that matter have uh, published a video on their website uh, which is aimed at informing potential group members of their rights. Uh, the members are told in that video that they've got three options, summarising it. First, they can opt out of the class action, and that means they indicate that they withdraw from the class and uh, that will prevent them from receiving any damages if the class action is ultimately successful, of course they're permitted to bring their own action should they choose to do so. Their second option is to sign up to the representative proceeding being brought by that law firm, and they do that by entering into a retainer with the law firm and signing a, a funding agreement with the funder. Their third option is to do nothing at all, uh, but they uh, they're told in the video that if they don't sign up now, they need to sign up at some point if they do wish to share in the proceeds of the, of the judgment. Now, that video came about because of uh, an application by the defendant uh, the, in the um, class action. And, and, the, and the reasons for that application are interesting, and I think they illustrate one of the difficulties for... Um, defendants in this area. The class action, uh, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, is an action in which the uh, owners of uh, buildings, and particularly um, it would be owners corporations because they are typically liable for the cost to rectify uh, defective cladding, uh, bring an action, as Declan said, under the, um, uh, the consumer protection legislation. Uh, and the um, the effect of that action is to say that our building has the wrong cladding on it or cladding on it that is not compliant with the Building Code of Australia and is defective. Now, a defendant presented with a, a claim like that would um, typically um, bring cross-claims insofar as the defendant considered that the reason that the uh, particular cladding was on the particular building uh, was because there had been a design uh, that specified that and that there had been, uh, been a construction of the building in accordance with that design. And it, it may be that um, there's some fault uh, with the designer and builder in respect to uh, that outcome. Now, as Declan said, time, um, the, for the purposes of limitation, time stops running for the uh, plaintiff and the defendant once the class action proceedings are commenced. But time does not stop running in respect to potential cross-respondents. And uh, the action is brought in respect of cladding that was installed, I think, um, since 2009. Uh, in New South Wales, at least, there is a um, backstop 10-year limitation period under the uh, Environmental Planning Assessment Act. And so that gave rise to a, a, a difficulty where the defendant perceived that it may be time barred from bringing cross claims against designers and builders, where it says that for a particular member of a class, the liability should be shared or should be entirely borne by the, um, those designers or builders or others. And I, I mentioned designers and builders, but 
Of course, there's also the overlay of the planning regime in New South Wales, whereby private um, certifiers are involved in uh, ticking off designs, and so again, there might be some liability uh, with them. So um, an application was made uh, to Justice Whitney in the case seeking some orders that would have the effect of closing the class, that is to say identifying with specificity the, the members of the class uh, and obtaining information from those people about the, um, the facts surrounding the installation or design installation of cladding on their buildings. Uh, on the basis that if that weren't done, the defendants would be prejudiced by reason of not knowing who was in the class and therefore not knowing who uh, might be the subject of cross claims and, and time then running out. Uh, now, His Honour um, held that the court didn't have the power to make an order of that kind, um, and His Honour. Um, uh, I think applied uh, applied Brewster, or at least referred to Brewster in so far as it was applicable, and it was not directly applicable. But he's on it. Said that he doesn't see how um, the court rules permitted an order to be made of the kind that was sought, particularly given the High Court's reticence in Brewster, um, uh, and uh, also he's on referred to another decision of the Court of Appeal in New South Wales called Hazelhurst. Uh, he's on we not to say, in fact, that even if the court did have the power, he wasn't prepared to make an order of the kind sought on a discretionary basis. Um, because of the very significant um, prejudice that would obviously flow for group members who were not able in the time that was permit, was allowed, um, which I think was six weeks, to, to put their hand up and say, we're, we've got cladding on our building, we're a member of the class. Um, His Honour uh, indicated that in his view, um, there was a significant likelihood that there would be uh, people who would not realise that they were members of the class and therefore would be shut out by uh, as an effect of that um, the order that was sought. Uh, so that, that illustrates a difficulty which is um, it's a little hard to uh, see how that might be otherwise resolved um, beyond um, proceeding with the class action as swiftly as possible so that the, that the risk of time running out is, is minimised. Uh, the third point that I wanted to raise is the recent decision in Wigman's and AMP. Uh, the decision was handed down by the, court, by the High Court on Wednesday last uh, week, I think, uh, in, this decision, in this case, which arises from the Royal Commission uh, into the banking sector and uh, a series of class actions which were brought uh, alleging loss um, by shareholders of um, AMP. Now the, um, the history to the matter is that um, a proce proceedings were filed um, <coughs> by Ms Wigmans uh, and then after her proceeding was filed, uh, I think five other proceedings were filed. There was then um, a, a fight between the competing plaintiffs, so to speak, uh, before Her Honour Justice Ward at first instance. And Her, Her Honour uh, decided that she had a power to um, uh, choose which of those proceedings ought to go forward. Uh, she, was a, she applied the decision of Pereira and Getswift in doing that and she said that what she was required to do under the rules was to apply a multifactorial assessment of the factors that uh, indicated which of the various sets of proceedings uh, ought to proceed. The uh, matter went to the High Court uh, on the basis that uh, Ms Wigman, summarising, ran the argument that um, the way the court ought to uh, proceed in this sort of situation was to apply the classic rules about stays and, and not to get involved in uh, adjudicating, as it were, between the uh, merits of the various competing class actions, but rather um, if the first in time um, is a properly conceived action, uh, then all the later actions ought to be stayed in the ordinary exercise of the, of the court's um, case management powers. Uh, now, uh, in, the, in the High Court, um, Justices uh, Keane 
and Chief Justice Kefal uh, agreed with Ms Wigman's submissions um, and applied the traditional approach to, to stays, but they were in the minority uh, two to three. Uh, Justices Gaylor, Gordon and Edelman uh, dismissed the appeal and endorsed Carolina Justice Ward's approach. Um, they held in a sense, in effect, that uh, what the court was required to do was to apply or follow the, the rules of court which are broadly expressed and give the court the power to uh, take into account uh, the relative merits, as it were, of the um, competing actions in deciding which should go forward. Um, and I won't go into the detail of, the, of how all the various factors were weighed up by Her Honour and approved uh, by, by the High Court, but uh, one of the significant uh, matters that Her Honour took into account was that the, um, the, the blessed, as it were, um, proceeding was um, uh, the uh, solicitors for that plaintiff uh, had entered into an arrangement which involved a no-win, no-fee model. And according to Her Honour, that was most favourable because it balanced the potential incentives and disincentives by putting the risk of the litigation squarely with the solicitors. Um, but she thought it was significant that that deal, uh, that no-win, no-fee model involved an uplift in fees if, if a... Uh, a settlement or judgment over a particular threshold was achieved, I think it was 80 million, uh, and she saw that as, as incentivising additional work, uh, which might be likely to produce a higher settlement sum by reference to that uplift to be achieved only when the stipulated threshold is achieved. Uh, and th th there was quite detailed evidence before Her Honour about the way in which, or the various scenarios that might play out, and the way in which the um, the terms of the retainer, the terms of the funding arrangements and so on would influence the recovery for um, members of the class and that's, that was the, uh, the, it was that comparison that Her Honour took into account in deciding which group should go forward. Um, that brings us then to the question of where we're going from here. Um, I think it's important to draw a distinction in this in making these sorts of predictions between, on the one hand, multi-dwelling residential type claims, like the Opal class action, and on the other hand, other claims. Um, in some ways, it's a coincidence that there are a number of class actions in the construction sector at the moment, I think, because um, the um, Sydney Light Rail um, class action, for example, is, is, is really a nuisance action. Uh, it arises from a construction project, um, but that's its connection with the construction sector. Similarly, the cladding actions are, um, are really consumer actions. Uh, it's just that they involve um, the use of a particular building product. Opal is a bit unusual because it's, um, it, it's a, an action brought where ordinarily the, you might expect the owners' corporation to bring the action. As Declan indicated, the claimants in the class action bring a claim for diminution in value of their units and that's that's a claim which would not ordinarily be brought by an owners corporation um, because the owners corporation doesn't own the space, the each of the apartments, the, the thing in which this, this value is said to um, sit. Uh, does that mean that we're, we've seen the start of a, of a rash of um, class actions for multi-dwelling residential buildings it, it may do. Uh, I think that it depends, and it will depend a bit on how um, Opal, Opal goes. Um, if there's a big headline grabbing um, uh, payout at the end of it all, that may well influence uh, funders in particular. And as I've, as I've mentioned, you know, the role of funders is an important dynamic here. But I think it's got to be said that Strata Schemes uh, legislation has functioned reasonably well. Uh, it's not as if um, I think it would be said that the class actions are, are, are filling a gap that's left by the Strata Schemes legislation. The um, technology construction list is still uh, heavily populated by owners' corporation matters, and so I don't think it's this case that those, those actions are losing favour. Uh, the, the other factor, of course, that will affect where this goes is 
uh, regulatory intervention. As I've said, I think it's crying out for more in intervention and I think we're going to see that. Um, the, uh, there was a parliamentary committee which handed down a report just before Christmas uh, on litigation funding and regulation of the class action industry. And the use of the term class action industry, I think, is telling. Uh, I mean, that's, that was a joint committee on corporations and financial services, so it perhaps has a focus on the financial side of things and, and things such as um, class actions by shareholders. But um, there's no reason to think that there'd be a special um, set of rules that don't apply uh, in the construction sector. The, um, the, 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 the view of, of in, in the, in the, um, amongst commentators as to what that report suggests is that it, if it's implemented, it will significantly increase the regulatory and judicial oversight of litigation funders and plaintiff firms, including with respect to funding commissions and agreements and disclosure of potential conflicts of interest. Uh, the recommendations by the committee include um, legislation to address the ongoing uncertainty in relation to common fund orders, which we've talked about, um, uh, something to address the multiple class actions making the same allegations against the same defendants, um, including the possible introduction of a 90-day of a standstill um, after the filing of the first class action to allow others to be, to be prepared and filed and then a selection hearing, so that's dealing with the, the matters that were the subject of um, the Whitman's decision. Um, uh, proportionality, a suggestion that there be some regulation to deal with proportionality of costs, considering factors such as the potential return to group members' impacts on court resources, regulatory outcomes and the public interest, increased regulation, direct court supervision of funding and contingency fee agreements, um, greater uniformity and clarity across jurisdictions and um, finally the continue, uh, continuation of the relaxed continuous disclosure laws which have been introduced uh, as part of the response to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, again, that I think speaks to the, the fact that this is a, that was a committee that was looking at the, the financial sector in particular. Now, th those measures, if they are implemented, are likely to be welcomed by defendants um, but there's, there's still scope for plenty of un uncertainty. The committee didn't recommend that the common fund orders be prohibited. Um, uh, in, indeed, it, it indicated it would be supportive of common fund orders being made at settlement or following judgment, um, and that's still being done, it seems, even in the wake of, of Brewster. Uh, the, the committee also endorsed submissions on behalf of defendants that the court rule should be amended to expressly permit class closure orders. So as I indicated, class closure was sought and rejected by Justice Wigney in the um, Aluko Bond class action um, in, in, in the circumstances of that case. Um, but it's interesting that the committee has ind indicated some sympathy to that idea, uh, which, as I say, is, is, is in, to the benefit of defendants on one view. Um, certainly it permits an early view to be formed of the size of the class and it suggested that that perhaps will facilitate settlement because uh, defendants who know what they're up for are more likely to be able to make projections and therefore perhaps reach settlements. So that, those are the matters that I wanted to raise in relation to where we're perhaps going from here. Um, as Declan said, we haven't sought in this presentation to deal with every aspect of the topic just to try to pick up some, some of the key points and, as I say, indicate perhaps where we're headed. I might ask at this point whether Frank wants to return to the lectern and perhaps we'll see if we've got any questions. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, both uh, Declan and Lucas. That was uh, tremendously informative and I'm sure that uh, we're all much better aware of the issues and the uh, matters we need to consider in the context of class actions. Might just ask those that are assisting us, do, do we have any questions on, online? All right, well, I, I had a question I've just been discussing with uh, Declan uh, off, off stage, if you may have heard or may not have heard. And it arises in the context of the um, recent decision and the question of competing class actions. And 
it, it occurs to me that if someone is possibly a member of A class, uh, and maybe this is the punter coming out of me, do they have to back a horse and see how that ultimately turns out? Uh, are they allowed to back more than one horse? That is to say, can they enter into a nominal class in more than one set of proceedings? Or are they required to, uh, as I say, throw their lot in with one particular class action, which may or may not get stayed in the context of competing class actions? And assuming they do back a loser in that context, uh, are they allowed to withdraw from that class, perhaps not lost, but stayed, and join the uh, blessed uh, class action, as you described it earlier, in terms of individuals who may be entitled to uh, enter into these classes for litigation, as I say, where do they stand, particularly where there are competing class actions? Lucas? Thank you, Frank. Uh, I'm not sure that I can give you a definitive answer to that um, because I suspect it differs um, from case to case and particularly from depending on the terms on which uh, a particular funder um, agrees to fund a particular action. Uh, if, if it's an open class, then the, the question doesn't arise. That is to say, if, and, and, and the particular um, punter, so to speak, has not signed up uh, on terms that would prevent them from um, jumping ship, uh, then it doesn't arise um, because the membership of the class it, where, where there is an open class uh, derives or flows automatically from, from the facts or characteristics of the particular person. So if, if you um, uh, have a particular airbag in your car or you have particular cladding on your building, then you are ipso facto a member of the class. Um, if the allegations relate to the, uh, that type of airbag or that type of cladding. I suppose where that might be different is if there is a, um, a closed class or a, a particular deal that's done by a funder with a group of, uh, with, with a group of members and somehow that a deal uh, binds the members to that uh, funder and that proceeding. But uh, my my experience is that that's very unlike, unusual um, and it would be, I, I don't know whether it's come up, but I'd imagine a court would look very heavily askance at such a, such a deal because um, funders are not seen as being permitted to, um, in Australia at least, gather, gather a group together and, um, and, and have the prospects of that, members of that group rise or stand or fall alongside the prospects of the funder. The courts... Um, are prepared to um, facilitate the role of the funder to a degree, but not, I would have thought, to the to the prejudice of a of a group member in that way. So, in the I don't know if people can hear me, but you might need to repeat the question. So, in the in the context of the recent Wigman's decision, those members of the class that were had their proceedings stayed could then join now into the proceedings that uh, have been allowed or, or blessed to proceed. Frank's question for the benefit of of those watching is um, whether the members of the um, women's group um, are able to transfer over so that they remain members of the class uh, in, in the, um, the uh, members of the successful group, as it were, in the women's decision. Um, I, I th that was an open class, and so all that was happening was that um, five or so separate representative plaintiffs and their teams, that is a funder <coughs> and a law firm, were approaching the court and saying, um, my action should be permitted to proceed. Uh, each of them didn't bring with them a, a, a list, a specific list of members. Rather, each of them said, I have an action which I want to proceed with and um, um, members of the class Caught by my action will um, benefit if I succeed um, without enumerating who those people are in advance. Thank you. Uh, Lucas, um, I also had a question for Declan in the context of the Opal litigation. Um, as Lucas described, it's uh, largely an action, it seems, for diminished in value of the lot owners. I was just wondering, Declan, uh, I understand the list statements and responses are all online. How have, has the class been described in that case? Because obviously unit owners can change, they can sell their units, they can perhaps crystallise their loss, 
uh, or they may uh, still be owners now. Uh, is it fixed in terms of a point in time and how are they described? Thanks, Frank. I've just done some frantic Googling on my phone, if you forgive me. Um, and it's an important question because the different ways that some of the uh, pleadings d describe some of the groups do allow for some fluctuation over time. It's not necessarily fixed at the time the proceedings are commenced. But in this case, um, the, uh, the group in the Opal Towers litigation is defined as being um, uh, people who, as at 24 December 2018, owned one or more lots in the Strata Plan or the common property. So that's, that's how it was defined in the original proceedings. So incoming purchases could not so form in, part of that class? For those that can't hear, Frank was asking whether incoming purchases, so people that have bought since 24 December 2018, uh, can be part of that class, and no, not on that definition. And that would, that would sit with the claim being based on a diminution in value because obviously incoming purchases would acquire with knowledge. Yes, I think that's right. For, again, for those who don't hear, Frank was saying that anyone that purchased after that time, uh, they had purchased with the knowledge that, uh, with, of the issues that, uh, or the alleged issues that exist in the building. So they wouldn't have a claim for diminution in value. So I think that's an important point as well. All right. Any further uh, questions? Or? Uh, I don't have any other questions unless we've got anything more from our attendees online. Well, um, as we do not, can I just uh, wrap up by thanking Lucas and Declan I don't have bottles of wine to offer them, but I can get them a glass of water somewhere. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and uh, look forward to you uh, uh, being with us for our next CPD uh, lecture uh, as part of the Greenway Chambers series. Thank you very much.